we are now on the third chapter in um, part three of mastering um, reactive, reactive, sorry, yes. And um, so the learning objectives for this particular chapter is we look at the building blocks of reactive programming, that is reactive values, reactive expressions, and observers. And then we look at how these tools are built from the low level functions, uh, that is isolate, observe and isolate functions, and uh, proceed with how, how error, error messages and signal conditions move on the reactive graph that we learned on the previous chapter. And lastly, finish up with shiny reactive values, which are built on reference semantics. Um, just to confirm, you can see my screen well. It's not too OK. OK, okay so for this particular uh, topic, I, I elect this subsection, the subsection, the title, the tools. So look, we look at the time, timed invalidation. Then we look at the two reactive value functions, that is the reactive val. And this is for a single value. And then we look at the reactive values, which is a list of reactive values. As you see here, um, we have A is equals to let's say ABC and B is equals to X, Y, Z. So while these two um, functions look different, they behave the same. So you can choose one based on syntax of your preference. So we can, instead of uh, launching the Shiny Apigen every time for this discussion, we'll do the reactive console. So using the reactive console function and saying it's equals to true, this will turn reactivity for interactive, for interactive experimentation without having to launch the Shiny app each time. And uh, lastly, we look at this function called react log. So the prerequisite knowledge for this particular chapter is the important properties of reactives, which is lazy and cached, as we had discussed in the first topic of this part. And other than are shiny are things. So this is the reference versus a copy on modify semantics, error handling in R and functions that can that are used inside other functions. So this is on exit or match dot um, arguments functions. So we'll also go and look at some of the examples, shiny examples and function. So we, this is on section 3.5 and section 3.6. So the event reactive. So this is, you want the value and observe the events, you want a side effect. So some of these things will be making sense as we proceed the discussion. And uh, we had learned on the shiny, the rec function, which like uh, stops the shiny and, and we see like an error that is, uh, that pops up based on a condition that you put. And also the reactive timer, and this is on this section 3.51. Like I've said, today we'll cover till observers. And then we can proceed with isolating code, time inval invalidation, come next week. Okay, so let's start. So we'll start with, uh, so this is just a summary. Mm, yeah. So, so this is just a summary. So let's see, we have got the two reactive uh, functions, so the reactive val and the reactive values. So we, we have said that the reactive val only holds a single value, while the reactive values function holds multiple values. And this is similar to a list. And um, it is def defined as follows. So we have this one value, so let's say reactive val one, and x is assigned to reactive val one. And then we have, when it is using the reactive values function, we have a is equals to one and b is equals to two. So when you, upon running this function, you will see that it will be a list with two elements where a is one and b is two. So when we want to get the syntax, we can, for reactive value, you can basically just run x and the function and the two brackets, sorry, and then we run that particular function. Uh, there, uh, we had the assigned objects, yes. And for the reactive values, is 
this is how we do it. And if we want to set an index, you say x into brackets two, and this is how we do for the reactive valve. And lastly is its class. So its class is a reactive valve. It's a reactive um, function and it's a function, yes. And this is basically reactive values for class for the, when we have the reactive values uh, function. So the reference semantics. So these two functions, the reactive value and reactive values always keep a reference back to the same value. So that if we do any modification, it also modifies all the values. So let's look at that example. So here we have a function f where f has an argument x and we want it to be assigned to uh, if x contains a value a, so it will be assigned to. And we can also have this other fun this other when we have a list where the list you have a is equals to one and b is equals to two, so the two elements in the list. And if we run f. Oh, sorry, what had, okay. So let me just run it from here. And if we run that X, you see that X is actually uh, giving us back the two. And if we run, then we run the X. There is okay. Okay. Um, so this is how most so for this particular um chunk, we see that that most R R functions uses the copy on modify semantics. But I thought it would modify. Okay. So if we run this particular, we see that it returns the two objects that were assigned earlier. So we have A is two and B is two. So this has been, um, it will it, it will return whatever that was assigned previously, yes. And if you want to look at just the initial object before changing, if we just run the X itself, Um, yeah, it has returned the value one and the value two. Uh, but we see that previously when we have just this function with just a, without any modification of the X, it has returned the original value, which was just two. So that is a bit different when it comes to the shiny. And um, so if we run this particular R chunk, we see that x1 and x2 have been assigned one, and x2 we have changed it to have to be assigned two. So when we run again x1 and x2, the value of x2 changes. So it is dependent on the change that you have made. So hence we have um, x1 as one and x2 as two. So this is how most R functions work. If you put, if you reassign an object, that will be changed. Um, but then a very, very interesting uh, chunk was included, I think in the previous cohort of R6. So R6 object uh, classes use, uses a reference semantics. Um, so I will just run this, but please be sure that I don't know what is happening here. So anyone who has worked with R6 can jump in and tell us what exactly is happening. So I understand we have got a function G where we have an argument X. So X we are assigning that it has an value A and it's given two. Then we have the invisible is equals to null. Um, anyone of us has worked with R6 objects before? So I can see Federica and Olu saying no. Brendan, have you before? Just to help us. Nope. Okay. So we will, I, I, I believe in the next discussion, Ren will join us. So we can go back to this particular R chunk and ask him what exactly is happening here. 
Yeah, I can um, I can add just that it's like a sort of container. Mm -hmm. um, there's a little bit more explanation um, in um, in another book, and then I'll I'll search for the the link and I put in the chat. Awesome. Because Thank you. I've, uh, th there is a video where I talked about the, this the the difference between uh, R object and R six object. So uh, they are capable to uh, contain more things mm -hmm. inside. So uh, I put something in the chat. So they give me a minute to, to find it, OK? Awesome. Uh, we will refer back to it after the discussion. OK, so we proceed with uh, this. So I will. So we'll be waiting for that, the difference between the R objects and the R6 objects from Federica in a short while. And also, this is also dependent on the previous R chunk. So you see something is happening. OK, so if we try to understand here, we have got the R6 function, R6 class object. We have got Y, which is whatever that was assigned. It is a list of A is equals to 1 and B is equals to 2. And if we run Y um, dollar sign new function, it gives us what we had um, written previously. And if we do the G of Y, so I have no idea where two is coming from. Um, oh, okay. Or it's because of this two. So um, the G of Y returns both of them to be two. Okay. Okay. Um, Federica has shared the link and I you can refer to this link for more explanation. Okay. If you if you if you open it, you see uh, because it goes directly to exactly the bit and says using R6 as a data storage. So this is the engineering production grade shiny apps, the, the, the book that we uh, did it after this one here, the shiny, the mastering shiny. So that would be something to do right next to this book. Uh, awesome. Yeah, it adds few few information and even even about marketing and how to like uh, put your up nice and everything but um in addition you find more more insights about things that you might don't find on the other one like this one here you see you can uh, uh it, it's a it's a special special object uh like in other objects in our okay yeah okay you, you know, but okay so reading so and then it means our next mission is now discussing the engineering production <laughs> uh, book. Okay, awesome. All right. Um, so I, I think once you read the link um, Federica shared, the, the above R chunks will make sense. Okay. okay. Okay, so both the reactive val function and reactive values function have reference semantics. So let's look at what this means and we'll do the first exercise from the book. So here, since I had previously run that we have the reactive console is equals to true. So if I copy this particular line, onto my console, oh, I had actually run that. We have got the L1 and L2, which is, so for L1 is a list of, L1 is a list of two objects. So, and L2, just run that, cannot run that alone. Okay, oh yeah. Yeah, and L2 is a list of two objects. 
and there was an, uh, something extra with so you see here this is since it's um it is a list we're using the reactive valves function with uh, two objects in it so the a and the b and you can also rewrite this by using the list function where we are assigning a to just have the one value and then but since we, we have said that with reactive value you can only use for a single value so we can do that with reactive value function one and the reactive value function two so i think in my understanding it's that the l1 and l2 are the same things <laughs> and um you can also do an another approach with the l3 object where we have got the reactive value and now inputting the list in it the list function in it so if we run that so if we run that we see their l3 okay why is l3 a function here a value Okay, let's look at the getting the syntax. It will probably make more, much sense. <laughs> so if you want to get the particular object in it, since we have got L1 with two objects, we see that it will return one. And we can do the same by saying L1, um, how we had learned in the R4 data science book, how to look at the components in a list. And we can also do the same by doing um so we have this the list we are calling the a and then with the um an empty bracket function so we see how we can get the values in these two in the list fun the reactive ones function which is a list it's by either of these three ways we can do that and for the L3. So for L3, if we do um, the L3 and then um, just the empty uh, brackets function and calling particular if a object, it returns the one. So if I understood correctly, is that these are the different ways we can we can use to call on to the objects in this particular um, L1, L2, and L3. So if we want to set, remember we have said that if we look at this summary table over here, it's that if you want to, so we have done the getting of the syntax. Now on to our next is now how we can set the syntax. So when we have got only uh, the reactive value, we can basically just do the X too. So this will, um, this is how we'll set that syntax. But when we have the um, the reactive val value functions, then we have to pick a particular object in it and then assign a value. So let's see that in an example. So we have L1 at if we L1 and the data and the A object, we have seen that it is one. Uh, but when we do L, but then we assign, I think, this case, and then we do check the, so it has been updated from now the one into having the 15, because we are re reassigned the, um, the object A to be assigned to not one, but now 15. And Let's see, we have seen, and so instead of, you can either use this way or you can do, um, so let's use L2, and we do the 15 again. And if we do that, you see that it has got its reactive value. The first one, which is A as 15 and no longer one, as we had done before. So I note that for L3, it can't easily update to just A. So it means that you have to do 
surface. So firstly, it was a reactive valve, and then you have the list. So we have A is equals to 15 and B is equals to, sorry, B is equals to two. But in this case, for us to change, we can't just do as how we are done when we just have the reactive valves or having the lists, then sorry, the reactive values, which is now a list, or um, the values A and B, now we put them together as a list. For L3 was a bit different where we have we had reactive valve, but now included a list in it. So if we want to set it, and then this is how we do it. So if we do L3, L3, then we do A, we have it as 15 instead of one. So if uh, basically this is telling us the reference semantics that lies when we are using the reactive valve and reactive valve functions. And the second exercise was on, we have to design and perform a small experiment to verify that reactive value also has reference semantics. Let me just uh, clarify something from the first exercise. Okay. Because uh, I, I discovered, I think, L1, we have the least value there was two values, A and B. Then you reassign a new variable to A as 15. But looking at the environment, we're having lists of three instead of two. Yeah, I, I, I noticed that as well. I... <laughs> I honestly have no idea. I, I thought if I run the L1, it should be with only a list of two or- Yes. Okay, so let's just check this and see what is inside here. Oh, okay. Must use a single, okay. So we cannot do that to check that. Um, I'll remove L1 from the environment and try again. Let's see. Sure. So if we do this, yeah, it still <sighs> returns as a. <laughs> mm. Okay, this is weird. Okay, in in. <laughs> Does anyone know Federico or have, you bizarre, have you assigned any function that depend on L1 at the top? Is there any other? No, 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 no. We started with L1 here. And it's supposed to be a list of two, not three. Mm -hmm. Or I just clear everything. Uh, I'm sorry. Okay, so let's. Uh, still be three. Or it's if, if someone but, can try uh, run. No, but, sorry. but A uh, doesn't contain two, doesn't contain two values. Like A is uh, both equals to one and two. Oh, really? Isn't it? Um, yes. We had a, fun a function assigning a value of two to A, but now you removed everything. So I don't see why, is the function still there? No, 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 no. Um, my environment is only has the L1. Yeah, this is data, but the, the, there's a list of functions. Oh, yes, there was a function up here that you had used A. No, it is before the G6. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure. I'm just saying um, because yeah. it's a, a reactive values uh, within A equals to 1 and B equals to 2. But then why it releases a list of 3? Because there is another value. Yeah. Um, and if I just say L1 and see, we have got the values is A and B. And we have got A as, okay. Um, hmm. Okay, so I, I, I found this, this, uh, this way quite difficult. 
because um i suggest the the best for me i'm not saying the best way is to grab an app have you got an app like which um which has this uh, like reactive values so this function inside so you run that app with the function and you you study the uh, because this is like uh, uh, th this is a function that goes inside uh, uh, shiny app basically yeah okay so and you do that because you want the the value will be reactive so when you click it when you slide it when you do something so the user uh, does something the the server react so, so you you can see things on the app so the best suggestion i can give you is to uh, choose an app with these values inside and play with it because otherwise so all these pieces uh, separate pieces um not sure if you can then put them to uh, okay I, I get that, your point that, <laughs> yeah you can you can even go to like the, there is um um what is it um it's a website okay where you you have uh, uh, a list of available apps with relative codes beside beside but there's some other other codes in uh, in the books as well is that is that um uh, an example of these uh, reactive values with a within a app in the in the chapter uh, yes there was because that, that that would be easier to me at least i don't know about you <laughs> but um maybe that that's a bit superficial yes i, I remember we learned about the the reactive Should be, uh, I, uh, I think the should be a. Um, what is it? Uh, I, 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 I don't remember the reactive value list that was in the bookmark in chapter one, but then the, the one that we learned. And now, um, when you have got the dynamic, I just checked through that L1 again. So, mm -hmm. right, just that L1 in your console, I discover is assigning a new variable called force. Just that L1 in your console. L1, uh -huh. I think the randomly false. Maybe that is the third value there. Aha, uh -huh. okay. So that is, no, it returns to the list. Yes. Okay, okay. But I, I get uh, Federica's um, argument that since these two functions will go into a shiny app, so having like an example with a shiny app who will make sense. Um, in our next discussion of this chapter, I will try create an example that you can see how this actually works. Is that okay? Yeah, yeah. Um, okay. Let's... okay. Um, so again, our next our next question was to design and perform a small experiment to verify that reactive value value function also has reference semantics. And this was the suggestion, solution, sorry. So if we have, so we have X is assigned to have a reactive value with value R1. So, and then Y is dependent on X because Y has been assigned X. And then now we've got another value, another object Z Z has also been um, assigned to have the reactive value one. So if you can run this, we see that X is a function, yeah? 
and if we do the y, see it's also a function because it is dependent on x and x is a function and also z will be a function. Yeah, so if we do the, um, the price, so I was looking at what this means. So this is what the our documentation says. It's the address, so the address function. So the address returns the memory location of the objects. Aha, uh -huh. so let's see if we run that, what happens. So this is the memory location for X, if I understand from the documentation. So if we run just the X, we see it will be a function of one. And then if we run Y again, it will be a function of one because X is dependent, Y is dependent on X. And also we expect this to be one because we have assigned this reactive val function to have the value one. If we change this, I now have x2. Um, so, and then if we run x2, the function again, we see that that has been replaced and then we have the two and we expect also the y to be two, that the z will be one because it is not dependent on x. So if we check the where the memory location is for x at this point. So let's see if it does actually, so it hasn't changed. And if we do for z, we'll have, we have a false. Oh, okay. We want to check if the memory location for the x and z are the same, so they're not the same. And if we do for y, I expect it to be true because y is dependent on x. So the location is the same. And if we do this with the initial value, so this will also be true. Okay, so we have proven that we have the reference semantics in um, the reactive value function, the attractive value function, sorry. Okay, so the next subtopic is on the reactive expressions. So we, we remember that reactive has got two important properties as we mentioned previously. We have the first one is lazy, that it only does work when it's actually needed and is cached. If it is, if it is called on twice and then it will previously it will returns the previous value. So this is an example where we have got a server um, input, output and a session. And you know that if we do data and then reactive, we have got some lines of codes um, that can go inside this expression. And we have show notification from the previous chapter that it's actually reading data. And we want the duration to be null and the close button to be false. Um, so, and then we introduce a new function called on.exit, which runs after this expression is evaluated. So an exit, it will remove the showing notification um, when that has, a, 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 when that the whole expression has been evaluated. And um, so if we have, on so if you want to do this successf um, success successfully, sorry, multiple times, <laughs> yeah, on this value is cached in the data function. So, um, 
basically that is what reactive expression is using. So we can use the show notification as an example. And if we look at now the errors, so the errors are, they are just cached, just like values, and they do propagate through the reactive values. And additionally, they, act, they, they have different behaviors when they reach. So what is this? We have the error will be displayed. We've got um, the error will be displayed on the app. And the other one is on the observer, so e.g. the observe event, um, which crashes the session unless you try to use the functions try or try catch. So how let's look at how errors are cached. So if we run R, object R, where we have got it's a reactive function, reactive, and then we want to stop when we have got an error occurred at this, and then we look at the system time. So when we run the R function, it will say that the error is the error occurred at this particular um, date and on this particular time. And we say that the system is a slip function then we run R again. We see that it has, it's like it has cached whatever that was. So the results that we had gotten previously, it will still be displayed at this point. So this has shown that um, R are just like any cached errors, are just like any cached, um, just like the values that are cached in an chain app. So the other point is that the errors propagate through a reactive graph. So if and I want to see if this will work. <laughs> so let's see. It is running and we have got error three. So let's see that. We have the fluid page, which is defining how the user interface will be. We have got the check box inputs. That, so when you click that, you say it's an error. And that has been displayed with what we see that if there's an error and then we stop, else it will give us one. So if we uncheck this, it gives us three. We have got one. And, um, just give me a minute. So, uh, sorry about that. So we have this, that it, um, the errors propagate through the reactive graph. So if we check this, it returns error, but if we can check returns three, I didn't understand where three is coming from. I thought it would return one. So let me, let me, let me comment. I think the first line there, A, if you check A is one, then if you go down, they say num B plus one, then C, oh, then yes. says C, yeah. which is B plus it. one, yes. which yes. will give us the. Okay. I, I say that. So we have got A, which is one, and then B is, we add the one uh, plus another one, and then the C is now B, which is now two, and then now two plus another one, which is three. And um, the result output that we want, it's a rendering a text, which is <clears throat> the C, which is no three. Okay, yeah, now that makes sense. Okay. Um, okay, so for the um, on.exit function, so we 
we'll see the on dot exit function in two ways. So inside the function bodies, so e.g. when we close this file um, once and the function completes, so it resets the plotting options after making this graph and also in the test that expressions. So in functions, for example, the code, the code in on.exit runs after all the rest of the functions has run. It runs even if there are errors or warning. So you can have multiple calls to on.exit inside a function and use the add is equals to true so as to call, so a call doesn't overwrite the earlier one. The expression in definition is of a reactive can be thought of as a function as a function body, but with automatic caching and laziness. So if we see this example, we have got the reactive. So do something, uh, do underscore something function with x and y, or we can use the event reactive, which triggers uh, with some triggers that we want and then input the do underscore something um, function as above. So it's either, you can either use the first one or, or this, this particular one here. So if we have a function and then do something like this, oh, all right, I have to stop this. So it just called, it's just a function. So let me say F1. Sorry. Let me see. One. Okay. So we all couldn't find the function or something. Okay. So because that is basically what it is, so we have, um, note that we have got a fun. So if fun, we, have a, we are assigning as, dot fun, as underscore function, and then with other arguments in it, and uh, um, the object fun. Okay. I, uh, so the next part is now the observers and output. So again, the two properties of reactive, it's like we, we keep on being reminded about the two properties. <laughs> yeah, but for the observers or outputs, these are, they're, according to the author, they are forgetful and eager. And exactly like that explanation, it's that they run as soon as they possibly can and they don't remember the previous action. So this eagerness is infectious because if they use a reactive expression, that reactive expression will also be evaluated. And also the value returned by an observer is ignored because they're they are designed to work with functions called for their side effects. So why would X never run in this case? Um, because in the reactive, graphs, the observers and outputs are the terminal nodes. And if they were lazy, nothing would get done. So uh, again, um, the eagerness is infectious, like I've just read from the book. That is, uh, the observer is a side effect node. Um, for example, if we have to write to file, this will send or sending messages to console. And also, how is this eagerness infectious? It is usually defined using the observed event function. So if you look at the output now, so we have assigned the outputs, and this is based on the placeholder in the UI. So some values, um, so when we both, when they're both created using the level, level the low level function observe, so let's see an example here. We have got y, we are creating a function using the reactive val uh, 10, so it has 10. Then if we put the observe message y is equals to y, so let's see that. So y is 10. 
And if we do y is five, we say that y is equals to five. And again, if we do y is equals to four, again, it has rewrite that. So clearly it is forgetful. It forgets that we had a 10 minutes, but then it rewrites it with the new value that you have assigned. So the observe function doesn't do something, it creates something. Like you see here, we have created um, saying that y, it's, y is 10, but then if we change that to us putting now the five, it will now um, like creating now a new, a, a new thing now that is y is five and so on. So we have got this example here that x is we are creating a function with with having one in it, and then we have got y um, with the observe function x, and then we observe again and print x. Okay, so we can run this first. And if we run again the y, so it has reprinted x. So y is dependent on the x, so it has printed one, yes. But if we do x2, we have, so it is two, yes. And then it has printed again the two. So it has, it has done some rewriting. <laughs> I, I, I also found what this to be a X3? bit confusing. What if you do X3? X3, okay, let's do X3. Okay. okay. Three values, because this is two values, three values, I suppose. <laughs> ah, okay, so if it is, you do X, so it will print only one when it's just X, but when you do X2, so it will print the two values, then do X3 to print the, so let's do, let me just go crazy and say five. That's okay. Wait, with five, it is four. And when we have four, what will happen? Ah, okay. So it, it, it does not depend on the value that we'll put. It will depend on how many times you run it. Okay, now that makes sense. All right. Okay. Okay. Um, so here, why this y function reacts each time x updates. And each time y reacts, it adds a new observer node that reacts to x. Now that explains why we have this. So each and every time we add a new observer, um, um, and each time um, we will be running y, a new observer, when then when we, when we add a new observer, and then we see. So for example, we had one, and then when we did add two, we have got the two values. Then we put the x3 um, function, then it is three. And then uh, when we do five, it will, a new, a new observer node will be added. So this, then we do uh, another one, another run, and then a fifth observer node will be added. Okay, thank you, now that makes sense. <laughs> All right, um, so there's also an, another- um, Sorry, sorry if I interrupt you. Do, do you want to see an example? Yes, please. I can stop sharing and then you can share. Whoa, sorry. Okay, there it is. I'll just mm -hmm. copy it and put it in my heart. But in the same time, we just have a look here and then. So this is an app. Uh, I don't know why in that chapter there is just an example with just reactive and not reactive val. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So this is uh, with reactive val. So basically, uh, you are interested in uh, having a reaction fast of the value. Basically, they 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 put it like this is um, the UI. You have uh, two action buttons, plus and minus, minus and plus, uh, whatever, um, and some value. So this is the value that will react to the input. So you have, you set 
the fact that you want to that the value will will be reactive starting from a zero so a starting point of zero okay then you have this input uh, and this other input which belongs to the action buttons okay the first observe event is for input minus and the, the second observe event is for input plus. And then the output is the uh, result of the reaction that will come up in the value. Okay, uh, I put in the in R. So if you if you can see, so there is can you see it? Okay. I'm yes, we can. To, okay. Um, so if I run it, very simple. So you have uh, uh, input minus, input plus, and the value here. So if you don't if you remember that the value is set to zero, and then react when you do the action button on the imp uh, so that that is the input you know input one and input two so when you you click uh the plus and minus you do uh the input you are sending an input to an action button that pass uh through so we'll we'll uh, reach the value which is set with a function reactive val. And so it will react. So if I click minus, so it takes one value off, minus two value off, and so on and so forth. If I do plus, add values. So this is it, nothing else. So this, this is uh, that you want that a value will uh, be reacting to an input to one or more input but uh, you know this is all i can so um, the the best the best the best suggestion is to like take an app and do little modifications uh, and uh, do experiments and this is the 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 the, the only the, the the best way i can uh, suggest this. otherwise it's turned out to be very complicated yeah um it, it was a bit abstract like yes i understand <laughs> this is what is happening but now if you tell me in a shiny out i have no idea what is happening <laughs> Yeah, um, please, if you don't mind, please put the link on the chat and uh, we can clear on with it. Yeah, just after the discussion. Okay. Um, okay, and um, just to finish um, up the discussion, we have got this another alternative example. So, and how I wish this could be in an app. It would have made sense. <laughs> so we have got the F1. It's a function with just the single value one uh, using the React val function. And G is also another function with um, having the React val with two. And um, so H, it's an observe function where it has the F function and then what will print will print the G function. Okay, so it has printed the G function, which is two. And let's see, okay, it cannot, all right. So it means that for us to see the content in it, we have to add this, the print function to be able to print that. Okay, all right, that makes sense. Okay, I, I, I think that is where I'll stop for today because that is where at least I understood some concepts. So the next time we'll do the isolating code and time invalidation. And I, I, I want to point out that we have got no one who has volunteered to, um, 
to lead the discussion on escaping the graph. I understand this is a very. <laughs> well, um, I'm sorry, um, Ryan has done a session last week. Yes, yes, yes. So I, I, I think Brendan wasn't able to lead the discussion. So Ryan took. Um, yeah, I follow it. Yeah. So we talked about the uh, the, the graph. Where is it? Yeah, the reactive graph. Yes. We talked about what is it? It was on the reactive graph. So could be the chapter sixteen is explaining better chapter fourteen. Yeah. yeah, escaping the graph. I know because I did it in the previous course. So he did it uh, last week. So yeah. I think it's now uh, the we we so we ended the the session mastering the activity. And so we get in through the best practices and uh, chapter 17 will be the next so general guidelines ah okay all right okay so we oh, are now... oh, yeah I, I don't know maybe he did it the reactive graph and not the escaping graph maybe he did it the because i don't uh, i think uh, uh maybe he did it the uh the active graph so you you need to do the escaping graph yeah, um, yeah, maybe yes. That, yeah, yeah, yeah. I made the confusion. I, yes, you know they're, they're kind of similar. Even I, I looked at the content; they are a bit, uh, <laughs> they're somewhat related. So I, I had a, a quick uh, look on the video, and I saw that you covered the reactive graph, and then so chapter fifteen, no one had um, uh, volunteered, uh, so I took that. And if any one of us can do the the last mm -hmm. bits of this particular. Uh, at escaping the graph. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Federica, no, do you mind if you, you take us through since you took us, you did the um, last I really, I really would love to, but uh, um, I think I did it uh, in the previous court. So mm -hmm. I want to, uh, maybe uh, uh, Olofemi, what, what, <laughs> what does he think? Yeah, Olu, what do you think? Can, can you take the, <laughs> no, <laughs> I know this is um, no. no reason. <laughs> well, we take we can just maybe uh, 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 like uh, have a look at the map and see sure. uh, what is happening. Um, um, this um, uh, just uh, the, we can uh, oh we are up the hour, but yeah. anyway um. I'll let you know because I'm and now I've made a confusion. So I don't remember if I did the reactive graph or, or escaping the graph because I, I think I did escaping the graph. Uh, okay. Exactly this one here. So yeah, I don't mind doing it again, eh? but you know, um, it's quite um, uh, straightforward as a chapter. Uh, and uh, it's basically, um, more or less the things that Ryan said last week. That's why I'm saying. Uh, so, okay. Yeah. Yeah. I, we can have a follow up discussion on Slack. Yeah. <laughs> and I, if, if not, I can just request Ryan <laughs> to uh, do this chapter if you'll be available. If not, we'll figure. We can also decide to take a break and proceed with uh, the other week. Um, but for next week, we can meet and finish up this chapter, and then we can make a decision to start the other chapter next week, that then coming week. Yeah. yeah. Great. Okay. okay uh, thank you so much. I wish you again a good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Uh, uh, Brendan, I'm so sorry about your internet connection. And uh, yes, we hope to see you next week. Yeah. Okay. Bye. All right. Bye.